I'll just use my indoor voice. All right. All right, keep coming in. We'll find a seat for you one way or the other. So uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Matthew McCoy. Um, I'm the chair of the town's uh, 350th anniversary uh, steering committee. I'd like to welcome everybody here uh, to the first of a set of lecture series uh, where we will be learning um, about the town's history. And um, our town is 350 years old this year. Uh, the importance of this uh, lecture tonight is to learn about the Narragansett Indian tribe uh, because our town is sitting uh, here on the land uh, that belonged to the Narragansett Indians uh, prior to uh, the arrival of uh, Europeans. So um, our uh, lecturer this evening, is uh, her name is uh, Loren Spears. She is the executive director of the Tamagwog uh, Museum. Uh, Loren is an enrolled Narragansett Tribal Nation citizen. Um, she holds a master's degree in education and received a doctorate of humane letters, uh, honoris uh, causa in 2017 from the University of Rhode Island and a doctor of education honoris causa from Roger Williams University in 2021. She's an author, artist, uh, shares her cultural knowledge with the public through museum <laughs> programs. Uh, she's contributed to a variety of publications such as Downland Voices, an anthology of indigenous writing of New England. Uh, through our eyes, an indigenous view of the Mashapog Pond, uh, from Slaves to Soldiers, the first Rhode Island Regiment of, in the American Revolution, and uh, Repair Sustainable Design of Futures. Um, she co-edited a new edition of A Key into the Language of America by Roger Williams, and recently co-authored, uh, as we have always done, Decolonizing the Tomaquag Museum's Collection Management uh, Policy. Uh, which was published in Collections, a journal uh, for museum and archive uh, professionals. Um, so uh, I was also uh, noted that, uh, so she's a teacher. She used to uh, teach school at uh, Newport. Um, author and artist, uh, tribal counselor, uh, previous tribal council member. And so we are very happy to have her here tonight uh, to share her knowledge with us uh, for this first and uh, very important lecture this evening. So, Lauren, welcome. This one work? Yes, there we go. Hello, everyone. Asuli Kwasan, Natasuis Makasani Pashao, at Nahai Gansik, Natasuis Lorraine Spears, at English. So hello everyone, um, as you just heard, I'm Loren Spears, um, and my traditional name is Makasani Pashao, and I am Narragansett Niantic, but I'm an enrolled citizen of the Narragansett Nation, and I'm welcoming you to our homeland, this place that we now call Rhode Island, and this specific place we now call North Kingstown, which is the homeland of the Narragansett people. And I have other Narragansett, uh, friends and relatives with me today, so I'm happy to have Dina Lynn here, and uh, she happens to be the Natural Resources Director for the Narragansett Tribal Nation, so, and relative. <laughs> so, is this working? Feels like it's fading in and out. Is it working? Yeah, okay. Just wanted to make sure we got a big crowd, and I want to make sure people in the back can hear, and I'll probably bop around, because I don't really like to stand in one space, but I wanted to greet you all and not just be over in the corner, um, so I might bounce back and forth. Um, so I'm going to share um, a little of our history. An hour doesn't give you much time to do anything, so I'll do what I can in an hour. But you know, it was interesting as I was preparing for this particular very focused presentation, thinking about North Kingstown a little bit more, um, I remembered going to the Lafayette powwow when I was a kid. 
I went with my grandparents. Those of you that were uh, longtime Rhode Islanders might remember Dovecrest, and my grandparents, Eleanor and Ferris Dove, and um, uh, Chief Warren Bull and Pretty Flower. And we went to that powwow when I was a child. I haven't been in a long time, and I don't know if it's still ongoing, but we went pretty much annually when I was a kid. And I happened to be, you know, trolling around social media, <laughs> not social media, wrong word, the internet. And I found this picture from the Library of Congress, and it happens to be Chief Stronghorse, who I knew very well in 2019, at about 97 years old. And um, he was, you know, part and gave the welcome song every year, year after year at the Narragansett August Meeting powwow, and was part of many of the ceremonies that reflect on the things that I'm going to share with you today. So I thought it was uh, an awesome image to sort of get us started in thinking about history, memory, and representation, and what that means, you know, in thinking about Narragansett history in this location that is North Kingstown. Um, I don't know whether this is going to freak out if I come over here with both. Oh, this one might not be on, so I'll do this. So I just wanted to think about um, the Narragansett Nation for a minute. You know, as a Narragansett citizen, I like to remind people that we were the largest nation in this region, um, that there were many tributary nations to the Narragansett nation. A lot of people call me up and ask questions like, well, what about this community in this area of Rhode Island? And I always kind of push back and say, well, one, the only federally recognized tribal nation in the state of Rhode Island. It's the only one with a reservation in the state of Rhode Island. And many of those nations tributaries to the Narragansett during colonial and pre-contact times. So whether that were uh, people in the Wampanoag communities, the Nipmuc, the Niantic, which today the Narragansett and the, are the Narragansett and the Niantic together, um, but the Nar Niantic were a tributary to the Narragansett. And so that's important to know. It's also important to know that we manage these lands. Um, in colonial documents, they love to say things like, the lands were wild and not managed and taken care of. And that was part of the colonial propaganda. If you're managing it effectively, then it um, means more when you're trying to take it away. And so if you say it's all wild, the people are wild, the animals are wild, the land is wild, which is why I'm trying to decolonize the word wild out of my vocabulary, and so I don't say wild plants anymore. I say indigenous plants and things like that, because we all have to think and actively decolonize our minds. So it's important to know that. It's also important to know that we had all these kinship relationships with other tribal communities, other nations nearby. Um, as I mentioned, Wampanoag, people out on... Uh, Block Island, which really are relatives of ours, um, descend and interrelate with the Narragansett. And the people out on Montauk and Long Island were also tributaries and had kinship relationships. So there was all this diplomacy going on, not only in this region of the southern northeast, if we decolonize, um, but also in the northern northeast, um, that we had relationships with the Iroquoian com communities and other um, Algonquin in places that are not called New York or, or think New York today. And of course, we had a very strong governmental structure and a very large population of people. It's just giving you a little bit of background. So I think it's important to tell the story because you, you know, Kingstown's kind of a coastal town, you know, along the bay. And it's important for people to understand that in our community, pre-contact, before Europeans came here, and even shortly, you know, during times after they arrived, we had winter villages and summer villages. And our winter villages would be inland, um, protected by the arbor of the forest, um, near the fresh waters, with the resources for um, maintaining your homes, protecting your village, and having the food and water and nearby. Um, but the important part, all of you have been to the beach. Can't be a good Rhode Islander if you don't, right? If you go today, well, maybe today wasn't a good example because it wasn't that cold today, but in a blistery January day, you don't want to be by the water. It's cold, it's biting, it's 
it's not comfortable. So if you move inland, you're protected by the forested areas. You're protected from the winds. Um, the, the resources are there. The freshwater fishing is there. The freshwater itself is there. The um, resources that you need are there. And so when we were traveling from our summer village to our winter village, we were harvesting the, the crops of the season and hunting and fishing and gathering what you need. And still today we do that, but we call that traditional ecological knowledge, the knowledge that's passed down from our ancestors to us today to harvest these things, to create um, what we might call art today, but the things our ancestors needed, whether that was baskets or pottery for cooking or tools for building, all of those kinds of things. And so um, the picture is actually a, a Nushquito or longhouse that my brother-in-law Cassius made along with his two sons, um, Cassius Jr. in Kiowa. And my two sons, Robin and Ridge. Um, it was for my eldest nephew, Cassius Jr.'s wedding um, preparations, and they were going to do a ceremony prior to the wedding with that uh, Nushquito. And if you go to Ashwag Farm, you can see another version of that Nushquito that my brother-in-law has made since then. Um, it's important to know when we're thinking about going from one place to the other, you have to think about the river systems. It's really important to think about the river systems. I put spotlighted river systems that are in this area. Um, and you know, the toxic, uh, Matatoxic a river that goes to the Pasquam, ah, oh, I can't talk all of a sudden, the Petasquamskit River, um, which of course go to the bay, and then the Chapuxic River to the Pawkatuck River to the Sound, um, and then, or the Atlantic Ocean. And of course, they were used for transportation. They were used for trade, uh, trade routes. They were used for diplomacy, and of course they were used for hunting and fishing and gathering, right? All of those things were used for the river systems. Even today, you can harvest so many things from the river systems, um, including, oops, went too far, including these lovely cattails, but you could also get um, bulrush and things like that that you were putting on your home making mats and things like that. That happens to be a picture of Princess Redwing from the 1950s, early 60s maybe, um, at the original Tomaquag in Tomaquag Valley, uh, Tomaquag Museum in Tomaquag Valley in Hopkinton. But again, in the summer homes, you're down by the coastline. You are um, shell fishing, deep water fishing, building fishing weirs, harvesting clay, making pottery, um, making tools, preparing your foods for the winter, whether that was smoking or drying those foods, um, growing your seasonal crops, because you did that in your summer village. Um, most of you know what a three sisters are, anybody? Yeah, yell it out. Corn, bean, and squash, right? So the corn, bean, and squash, but we also had gourds and melons and um, sunchokes and sunflowers, to just name a few of the crops that we grew in our gardens. And those gardens were really, really big because they were meant to feed the village. And the villages were quite large as well. And so these spaces and places were places that um, early Europeans came like Verrazano, who came up the bay and s spoke to the stateliness of the Narragansett people and how tall we were, um, also spoke to how many there were, estimating about 100,000 indigenous people in Narragansett Bay, right? Now, of course, we weren't all just standing there waving at him. <laughs> but the idea that there was all these people on, you know, thinking about Aquidneck Island and, you know, the whole bay, the, the upper bay, the lower bay, um, and thinking about those villages. And that would be all along the waterways, all the way down, you know, along the Atlantic coastline, um, down to what it would be the border of our territory, if you will. And on average, Historians, anthropologists, those folks, they say on average we had about 500 people in those villages. Based on some of the archaeological finds and the, the descriptions that they've come up with, that there's been approximately 500 people per village. If you think about that, in a time period without the technology that we have today, that's a lot of people to care for. That's a lot of key people to um, feed 
and clothe and house and, and have jobs for, and our communities did all of that. We had all of these things that were our resources that were there that were so important to us. Um, our cultural norms or life ways, as we like to say, around the jobs that we do. You know, they're just as complex as we do today. It's just that it was then. And it was really important for our communities to have access still today, but then to the resources of the land. And when Europeans first came here, they started to change that land. They introduced um, cattle and hogs that started destroying the clam beds and the understory of the forest, um, eating the, the plant life that were things that we were harvesting for medicines and for foods and for resources for creating things. Um, and if you notice that quote on there, it's like, as colonial settlements grew, the ch General Assembly began to restrict sustenance activities of the local tribes, including the felling of tea trees and the taking of deer. And that's a quote from the Secretary of State's website. Um, and that's important because um, when they started restricting the harvest of bark, there's a law in Newport that specifically speaks to bark, but the felling of trees, it starts to interrupt our life ways. We can't, if we don't have trees, we can't build our home, our homes. We can't build our means of transportation, dugout canoes and birch bark canoes. We can't um, harvest foods that we need. We can't get resources like um, uh, inner bark for making cordage and uh, inner bark for medicine, like from the poplar tree, for example. Um, we can't um, make baskets and bags for storage. Um, all of these things get interrupted when these rules come into play. And so um, even though folks like to say that Roger Williams, RW as we like to call him affectionately, um, was our best friend. Like that's the mythology here in Rhode Island. There were a lot of things that were not necessarily to our best interest. Um, even though when Roger Williams and other historians also agree with this, when he first came and the Narragansett leaders, uh, Myantinomi and Canonicus, gave him permission to be in our territory. He understood at the time he was a tributary and had to contribute to the people. And over time, that gets manipulated and changed into different perspectives on ownership and land ownership. Um, and so as we um, are understanding this clash really of ideological worldview is starting to happen where we were a more communal people where we were working together and yes we were living on the land and yes there were boundaries and territories between tribal nations but there weren't the rules of European ownership where you put a fence around something and you no longer can hunt a deer on it or cross a, go across it without there being a fine or some kind of uh, negative consequence and so those are changes that start to happen there. And even though Roger Williams was very much interested in r religious freedom, and yes, to some extent, he does advocate for our rights to do our own thing, he speaks about it very neg negatively, calling us pagan and heathen and things like that. You can read that right in the key into the language of America. Um, which we did a new edition of where we added footnotes so you can check out what we think about certain things. But it's, it's just, you know, an ideological worldview he's coming from, a space and a place that it's really hard for him to wrap his brain around our culture and our perspectives of life and our understanding of the creator. And so as Christianity starts to get introduced and with contact there's introduction of disease. Keep in mind, even though there were great plagues, the, the Narragansett were not a nation that was hit hard by them, um, but we were certainly had plenty of other kinds of things that were displacing us. Um, when the Royal Charter of 1663 comes into play, I put one of the quotes there. It gives the, 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 the new colony of Rhode Island the permission to invade and destroy the native Indians. And that's right in the Royal Charter. You can go read it for yourself. And so 
even though Roger Williams is represented as one of our best friends, he's actually very complicit in uh, the Pequot War. He's complicit in, uh, even maybe more so than complicit, he's overtly sharing information um, by his friendships, quote unquote. He's sharing information to the colonies. Um, partly because his wife is also very connected with the Massachusetts colony. And so um, between the two of them, they are sharing all this information back. And so, um, you know, there's a lot happening here. But let me move forward because I can get really lost in that. But I wanted to, like, give you some focus on, on North Kingstown. And so, of course, we know Cocum Sussex, and that ties in very nicely with Roger Williams, right? Because, of course, that becomes a trading location. Keep in mind that before Roger Williams came along, it was a trading location for the Narragansett people and other um, people that were meeting, if you will, in the Cocum Sussex Cove. Um, Roger Williams, Richard Smith, they then later ha had a trading post in that same spot. Some people even called it a quote unquote an Indian trading post, but it meaning that it was modeled after the style of trading that we were doing. Um, it is one of the, is the oldest uh, plantation house still in this country representing that time period. And it's interesting that it's called that because people in our state, we love to forget our historical past and the enslavement that took place here. It's very nice to kind of skip a couple hundred years and remember being abolitionists. Um, and I can understand why we would like to do that, but truth is the truth is the truth. Um, and so um, Bob Geek and I have done a bunch of uh, kayak tours, or a few, in the cove um, there and have partnered at different times on different topics, uh, particularly around Roger Williams. Um, and it's really quite a sacred space or a sacred feel to go in the cove and actually be in a kayak and just be in the beauty of that space and to think about the burial grounds that are there that are kind of, you know, you have to kind of get to them. We didn't actually go on them, but get to where to see the area that they are because of the water. Um, they're kind of out um, and not easily reached on foot. And so um, to think of the people that were enslaved there, um, Roger Williams did have indigenous slave um, and other slaves. Um, so it's, it's one of those things that sometimes people don't want to talk about. But I'm afraid if you don't ever talk about it, you never heal from it. So you have to talk about it. And so this is a place that has you know, some interesting history to it in relationship to indigenous peoples and enslaved enslavement and you know just that history of farming and farm life here one of the things i like to remind everybody everywhere that there are cities today and you know big spaces are really narragansett spaces um and usually the place that we had our biggest villages is where y the colonists then took over as they pushed us um south i will say in the in the area so one of the big things that uh, took place in this area is the Atherton Purchase. Um, for those that don't know, it was around 1660. Documents say 59, 60, and it keeps changing depending on what document you look at. So I'll go with about 1660. And if you kind of look at the bottom, um, see where that bottom cross is right on top of the map? You can kind of see a little dotted line that kind of jogs left on an angle and then down kind of towards Charlestown almost. It's probably still South Kingstown, but it's closer to heading towards Charlestown. Um, that sort of weird triangle or sort of triangle there um, is the lands of the Atherton Purchase in that map. Um, and it was really done through some serious treachery. Um, not just my words, <laughs> but actually documented words by a lot of historians. Um, the, the, the Atherton Company, they and the people in the family of Atherton, um, actually used a lot of treachery. And one of the things that they did is they utilized family members of the Sachem Pesicus, and not him, but family members, it was his, one of his younger brothers. And it's documented that um, they took him, kept him for days, plying him with alcohol until he was completely drunk, then took him to Boston to secure, quote, unquote, rights to this land. 
Um, they also were using other strategies like defaulting on loans or mortgages um, that were being put into place. And Rhode Island actually found that this transference of land was illegal. Um, don't know how much they did with it, but for a period of time, it was hard to sell land there because of them s finding that it was illegal. Um, the Atherton uh, company actually played a key role in fighting and removing Indians, us, uh, indigenous people, the Narragansett, from the land. Um, and that was a big purchase and a big impact on this space and place. Um, History isn't very pretty. I mean, we know the, the history of dispossession across this nation um, happened, but it happened piece by piece like this to remove indigenous people, and specifically in this case, the Narragansett. <coughs> so I decolonized the war for New England. What you might know as King Philip's War. Why is he blamed? I don't know because he has to be the blame because that's how wars get told by the victor, right? Um, some people will say it's his fault because he was in agreement with the English at one point because he was trying to get under, out from under the Narragansett, and so therefore he partnered, if you will, or allied with the, the British. But then as they started encroaching and taking more and more land and more and more resources, then they started changing their mind and fighting back against that encroachment. And so um, King Philip or Medicom, he, uh, the war begins for them. The Narragansett and the Niantic, we stay neutral. Um, Kanachet, one of our Seicho, even signs a treaty of non-aggression. However, at the same time he's signing a treaty of non-aggression, he says he's not going to give not one pairing of a nail of a Wampanoag over to the English, which um, is very provocative for the time, right? He's, um, we're housing Wampanoag women, children, elders uh, in, in our communities. And so these are some of those historical images of Metacom and the Kanachet Monument that's here in Rhode Island. So what happens is um, on December 19, 1675, a military force is raised by the United Colonies of England and raids the fort at Great Swamp, killing women, children, elders, burning the village. Um, estimates range from 500 to 700 of people passed and perished during that time. Um, for colonial um, wars of the massacres of that type, that was a large number. 500 was a large number. Um, and so this is a drawing that was done by Tall Oak, uh, who since passed, um, his image and rendition of what he felt the pain of that circumstance was with uh, women, children, and elders fleeing. And so the war drags the Narragansett into the war. And um, Cocum Sussex is really, Smith's Castle is knee deep in it. They're actually using Smith's Castle as the, the troops as they disperse them into the war. Um, and then later used it as a place to heal people, you know, when they were injured from the war. So this is the, the, the really beginning of war and genocide and really overt displacement. We were already being slowly displaced in our homeland, but it was minor at this point because our full sovereignty was intact prior to, to King Philip's War. Um, which why I call it the War for New England is because that's what they're trying to create. They're trying to create a new England. And most people forget that King Philip's War to 1675 to 1676, and we now call Southern New England, and all the way up to 1675. And so we actually created this place called New England, and that war was to break the sovereignty and uh, political alliances and um, allegiances that indigenous people had. However, I will say, our sovereignty. That England and colonies deep in the 
leadership within the Narragansett community all through this last 400 years. So um, that's partly why we are able to be federally recognized as well, because of that continuation all throughout time. And so, um, but whether we like it or not, there starts to be these different forced assimilative practices through indenture, which is just a glorified word for enslavement, um, and actual overt enslavement um, within indigenous communities here in the southern New England region, including the Narragansett, were sold off into slavery into the Caribbean, and uh, places like Bermuda and, I don't know, the other Caribbean islands, Barbados, and things like that. And um, also enslavement here in Rhode Island and the Providence Plantations, as it was once known. And so it's really important for us to um, ensure that we understand that um, to sort of deal with the, the challenges of the time, the Narragansett and the Niantic merge into one people um, and continue to fight for sovereignty using various you know, political and educational and other means. Um, the reason I put education there is, just as a little aside, is that was a form of forced assimilative practices R here in Rhode Island. Um, the, the final industrial school closed in 1978, same year the Indian Child Welfare Act came into play. So also, stone's throw from here, um, the Great Swamp Memorial Site, every fourth Sunday in September, um, the Narragansett people, uh, we go to the uh, memorial site. Um, some of you might know that uh, that was turned over to the Narragansett tribe a couple of years ago now. Um, but we honor those that were massacred, we honor those that survived, and we honor those warriors who served over the last 400 years in this country, indigenous people have the highest number per capita of service in the U.S. Armed Forces. And that's not usually recognized. There have been times during our history where people read off a whole row of Narragansett people that served in the military. And so we honor the past, the present, and the future generations um, through that ceremony, which is a really important one. It's actually open to the public. If you note that date of the fourth Sunday in September and show up there, <laughs> you could actually participate. Um, I will admit we're not the best on communications, um, but people that are in the know just show up and, and come to the ceremony. That happens to be a picture of myself and my Aunt Paula there at Great Swamp. Um, we were getting interviewed by uh, Jeanine Miller from the Providence Journal talking about our history and culture there and just the pain of that space and, um, and of that history. So in another quick that way, um, I shouldn't say that being that I I'm going in the wrong direction. I was doing it from my house, almost. Um, flick that way, I think. Um, we can speak to Queens Fort, which is, of course, on the North Kingstown Exeter line. Um, in order to get there, you kind of have to drive in on the, well, I guess you could drive in on the Exeter side. I've never done that. I've always drove in on the North Kingstown side because it's the closest way. Um, you can go to Queens Fort. Uh, Queens Fort is no, called that for Queen Quiapan or Queen um, Magnus, as she was known, or the old queen. She had a lot of names. Uh, but the Sunk Squaw is the traditional word for a leader. Um, and we had many female leaders in our, our community and in this region. Um, and it's only because of Europeans that the word queen one gets put on them, but also the attempt to subjugate them and not have them be equal to the men. Um, in our communities, if you read um, uh, Lisa Brooks' um, book, um, oh my goodness, it just flew out of my mind, um, Our Beloved Kin, uh, she s speaks to how they try to undermine the female sachems trying to get other people to sign off and how other male leaders fight back against that and say, no, they won't do that. But um, Quiapin uh, had her folks build this fortification. Um, they often talk to, um, what is his name? Something John, my brain just went on a fog. Um, Stonewall John, that would have been easy enough, it's a stone wall. Um, 
you know, there's some fact and fiction on whether what his name really was, but I'm sure he had a traditional name, but it, that he built that wall, and I'm sure there were others that were helping. And we have a long history in our community of stone masonry, of stone walls, and uh, stone tool making, and uh, the, the understanding of the landscape through stone, but this was actually a defensive fortification. It wasn't the village that they were living in, it was the fortification site. Um, and so they, she actually led warriors against the colonists. However, jo uh, Josiah Winslow attacked um, Queen's Fort and the village surrounding it um, and ki uh, burned over 150 Wituanash, uh, which is, uh, Wutus are the homes, the dome-shaped homes. Um, according to some historical records, those were burned. But she was the last Narragansett Niantic leader to be captured and killed during the war of King Philip's War. Um, and she was captured in Nipsashuk uh, Swamp, which was north, way north of here. Um, but they fled from uh, Queen's Fort, so I've been to understand, from there to the Great Swamp, but didn't stay, and then from there to Nipsashuk Swamp. And of course, after th this time period, um, that's also the time period of the Great Swamp Massacre. It's a uh, really interesting. How many people here have been there? No, the Queen's Fort. Yeah, so, yeah, on Stony Lane. So it's just such an um, unbelievable space to, to your ancestors there and the art and the, the engineering prowess of our ancestors, um, which is really amazing to think about um, and to continue to um, celebrate. Um, so skipping around a little bit, uh, I wanted to just point out this book that I did with Bob Geek on From Slaves to Soldiers um, in the First Rhode Island Regiment in the Revolutionary War. So I did a quick digging, and um, on the big list that we have, there's about 70 indigenous people that served, um, but two of the indigenous people, William Corey and James Updike, who was a fifer, were from North Kingstown. <laughs> so I thought I'd share that. We have a lot of people that were documented in Charlestown and in, in, in South Kingstown and Narragansett and Westerly. There wasn't quite as many documented in North Kingstown, but out of those 70 people that are listed um, in, in this book, in the back, um, Maybe a third doesn't say where they're from, so you don't even have a clue. So they could be from anywhere in this region. Um, but you know, in this book, it's really important for us to talk about this. One, I have to always push back on the title, publishers, right? They like keywords that are provocative. Everyone that served in the Revolutionary War, both indigenous and African descended, were not slaves. One. Two, um, all of them that served, um, or many of them that served, got commendations of various sorts and had done amazing things to help with the war. Um, without indigenous and black descended people, we probably would not have won that war. And maybe we'd be living in some other version of Britain here. Um, so it's really interesting to think about that. but. Um, when you think of the number of people that served in that regiment, it's quite astounding that there were that many indigenous people because most people, even when we say there are indigenous people there, they always like to think it's like four or five, as a 70. Um, and I put a couple of the names there too because Milkeik and Skisuk and Sakshuk are all like indigenous sort of, but most were surnames that you're even familiar with today, like Hazard, Brown, Fry, Henry, Perry, um, which are very prevalent names in our community still today. Um, and I think that's important to, to think about. Oh, Devil's Foot Rock. <laughs> Everybody loves this. So we all know it's a large granite ledge, and it's got these footprints in it or that appear to look like the hooves of a, of a devil. It's near Quonset, and there's lots of legend and mythology around that. Um, you know, 
There's lots of Puritan perspectives going on around. I mean, we live in what is New England, and there's so much about witches and witchcraft and devilry and, you know, what is really religion and what is not. Um, and so I think there's just like a really big um, push to <sighs> this mythology around devils and devil worshiping and things of that name. Habamak, which is how I've always said it, uh, but I've also seen it as Obamako, um, which is supposed to be the devil in, in Narragansett. Um, and so there's these stories around it that maybe um, an indigenous woman was being chased by the devil, or, and then other times I see it that it's a colonial woman's being chased by the devil. You see a theme here? It's women that are being chased by this devil. Um, and I always think to um, stories that I've been told about witches and witchcraft, and people like to equate indigenous spirituality witchcraft, which is not the same thing. Um, but in colonial New England, when a woman, and I'm not talking an indigenous woman, a colonial woman, uh, her spouse passes away. And right now, for a minute, she owns the property. Now, if she's a good colonial woman, she marries someone really quickly so that he can own the property. But if she does not, they say she's a witch. And if she's a witch, they drop her down the well. If she died down in the well, oh well. If she lives, then she definitely was a witch, and she gets burned at the stake. So in other words, you don't win. And so I tend to think that a lot of this notion around devils and devil markers is part of that colonial witchcraft notion. Um, not to say that we don't have devils of stories. We've got John Onion, and John Onion uh, tries to race the devil on skates. And so there are stories of that, but I can't speak because John, uh, the kid is on skates, you know. So that's not an old, old story. <laughs> it might be a couple hundred years old, but not old, old. So I don't know if even in that traditional story for us, if it came into play, um, later during this colonial time, its influence of witches and witchcraft. Um, there's um, also the cemetery there, which is the archaeological site, um, but there's some documentation of grave robbing, and it just made me think of Na and the NAGPRA laws that we're dealing with today, um, Native American Graves Protection Repatriation Act, if you're not familiar with it, um, because Unfortunately, indigenous um, grave sites in our history have not been respected and have been disturbed and uh, stolen from, including our ancestors' bodies or skeletal remains. And so that law has been put into place for uh, institutions across this nation to return our relatives to us so they can be reinterred and to return those few to our communities, um, and to respect that. Um, I think that if you see the, the um, marker that's there, it's for um, Canonicus, but it's like a fake marker. Um, someone put it in like a couple hundred years later than when he was living to memorialize him. You know, people get fascinated. There was a time period sort of from the mid-1800s to 1900s, that memorialization was a big, big thing. And so they put these stone markers. You can go down in the markers for Walla Room. You can see stone markers and monuments of various sorts um, around uh, to memorialize. But on one hand, it sounds good because they're memorializing and thinking about indigenous people, but they're really doing it in the same way that museums, and I work at a museum, so I understand this fully, um, are doing the salvage paradigm. Those people are all gone, or almost all gone, so we're going to save all their stuff, including their bones, and we're going to memorialize them because they don't exist anymore. And so this is part of that, um, in my opinion. And so um, even though it might be nice that it mentions Canonicus, I don't know as though it's the true kind of recognition recognition and um, memorialization he should get. 
So let's go into some more villages in Northeast Town. So this is um, Wickford. Um, I have to say, as a kid, I went there all the time with one of my best buddies. We'd ride our bikes over to Wickford and have a blast. Um, and then I didn't really think about the history of the space. Um, but it's important if you've ever gone on the Historic Signage Walk, if you go um, down um, behind the Wickford Kitchen Factory outlet there, uh, down that path. It's not a far walk, but it is down the path. You can see this beautiful signage that was done by Dawn Spears and uh, Angel Beth Smith with the folks from Histwick um, that did the signage project, kind of depicting the village that would have been there in our history. Um, it's also important to understand that when you're down the road there, is that brown? I never, you know, I'm such a Rhode Islander, I don't know. Just go straight, it's there. You'll land in the water and you'll know you're on the right spot. Um, uh, that also, that would have been a, a trading space, right? And keeping in mind that all along, all of the coastline that is the bay and the salt marshes, there would have been villages all up and down the bay and all along the open ocean, as I mentioned at the very beginning. So it's really important because we're harvesting that plant matter and that animal matter um, for our families and for our homes and for our resources there um, to ensure our sustainability as a people. Um, so this is the village at Nam Cook. Um, I have, uh, when I ran the Weetorn School at Tom McQuad Museum, the students there actually did a big project in partnership with Rhode Island College, uh, URI, um, and uh, another school that had done another section of it. Um, and our students did it from an indigenous perspective. So um, these are actually um, pictures that the kids took, the one on the left there. Um, so you see the, the kids writing kind of underneath on that piece of paper. Um, but it's a beaver tooth scraper um, that was used for scraping hides and scraping dugout canoes. So I uh, borrowed a picture from one of my friends uh, that um, worked at uh, um, Darius Coons is in there. He used to work at Plymouth Plantations. And that's a picture of them doing the dugout canoe. Um, and so these things would, you would use everything. So you wouldn't just take the beaver and eat the beaver and then throw everything else away. You would use everything that you could from it. So um, in our archive, we actually have a recipe for beaver tail stew. Never had it, but um, I'm willing to try. Um, and you know, we would harvest everything for, your f for food and for clothing, for tools you know, and so on. So all of these things can be utilized um, for all of that. Here's some more tools that were found at Nam Cook, uh, stone points, scrapers, knife blades. Um, today we have some really talented artists. My husband, uh, Robin Spears Jr., my son, Robin Spears III, a relative of ours, River Spears, that's doing some amazing work with stone tools. Um, I'm sure there are others. Those are just the ones I know right off the top of my head. Um, and the axe was also from Nam Cook. Uh, and these are you know, tools for hunting, gathering, agriculture, fishing, and engineering for building things. And so it's really important to see them, but also to put them in context. Um, this is also from Nam Cook. Uh, this is um, pottery shards, or the, the top of the pot, where you see the, the etching um, and stamping. And then there's a mortar below and a pestle above that was also from Nam Cook, and you know speaks to some of the cooking implements that could have been used. And so I thought I'd sort of wrap up with thinking about other places in uh, North Kingstown <laughs> that, of course, have um, Narragansett names, but also things that we're thinking about, like Quinesset, um, that is um, places we go and use the word all the time that are Narragansett words. Uh, so I wanted to talk about also the things that maybe we can't see, bases, uh, cere ceremonial landscapes, whether that's burials. Um, I did not put burials in my um, imagery because I think that's inappropriate, but I can speak to like the stop and shop that's at the intersection across from Home Depot. Like that, they had to, in order to build that metropolis there, they had to actually dig up and move a Narragansett burial. 
Um, it was reinterred. There were ceremonies that took place to do that. But when you think about progress and that kind of thing, sometimes that's really disturbing things that are of importance and of the past and that should be protected. And so I think that's really important. There's also other things in our ceremonial landscape. Um, there's things like uh, drum rocks. Um, I think you have a spot that's called Speaking Rock somewhere in North Kingstown. Um, and I haven't actually been there, but we have something that we call drum rocks, which are speaking rocks, but they're usually a glacial moraine of some sort with a great big on top. And I don't know if that one is the same, um, but all over um, what we call South County today, um, well, I shouldn't even say that because they're in Warwick as well. I've seen them there myself. Um, but if you think of like all over this region, let me be broader, um, there are those drum rocks. And historically, we would move those drum rocks if you use your heartbeat and you have the, the, the movement together, you can actually rock the rock and that still reverberates to the next drum, drum rock and sends a message, if you will. So there's those. And then there's also ceremonial stones. Sometimes they are what we call a cairn that's in the landscape, um, which is a stone pile, if you will, that people don't seem to understand why it's there. Um, sometimes they're directional, and they kind of let you know where you're at. Um, if you think about, I always like to think of it this way. In our history, you know, when this space was vastly uh, forested and you didn't have the same kind of roads that we have today, you would um, travel from place to place and you would come to a cairn and, hey, at that cairn, you take a left, <laughs> you take a right, you go straight, whatever. Um, you know, that helps you to find that. There's also rock shelters. Um, I know at Queens Fort, there's a, a, a natural shelter there, um, but there's others this whole region, um, a variety of um, ceremonial things in the landscape. In uh, Hopkinton, I can't speak to North Kingstown on this, but Hopkinton, there's actually a stone formation that the four points equal the four equinoxes. When you do the math out and you do the science, um, so there is undoubtedly things of that nature in this ecosystem um, as well. It's just that how built things become and whether those things get disturbed or not. So I think that's really important. And then I would also say places like Casey Farm. Um, that's a beautiful landscape there. The, our villages would have been there. They've actually found archaeological things informally in that space just through and I just like to say that even if there's not an overt village in a space, does not mean that the lands around where the villages were aren't being utilized um, by our ancestors for all the things that I mentioned, the hunting, fishing, gathering, uh, transportation, uh, medicines, and the like. Um, and so all of those things are important uh, to us and to this place. And so um, on that note, I'm going to make sure I didn't forget anything I really wanted to say. Oh, I know, there were two things. I wanted to make sure if you wanted to dig a little deeper in the history, feel free to go to the roadtour.org. And if you go scrolling down to the tour, that was done in partnership with Tom McQuad Museum. Um, and then on the Encompass online textbook uh, by um, Rhode Island Historical Society. If you want to snap a picture, you can. Um, there's uh, some things. I also put, those were the, the, um, the Compass is first, the Road Tour is second. Oh, the article by Jamie Miller um, that I referenced at Great Swamp, where the picture's from. And then on the right-hand side is just Tom McQuad Museum, uh, spaces where you can get a lot of information, the belongings blog. Um, which is on our website that we put a lot of good stories in there for you to learn about. The archival research um, pages has a lot in there as well. Um, and then our resources uh, pages for educators. And uh, there's lots of things going on. And oh, do please take down the website because we just ordered new brochures. And I saw the box, but I forgot to open it up and bring some with me. Sorry about that. Um, so. Um, if you do that, you can get the website. We have a lot of programming. Once a month, a free lunch and learn uh, is happening. So you can get that from our website. 
our children's hour in the summer. That's too far ahead. What else is going on right now? I don't know. My brain just went on a fog. The only thing I can think of is lunch and learn. Um, oh, we're going to be doing a virtual maple sugar Thanksgiving coming up in March, so you can sign for that. Um, and um, there's a lot of other things, but you can check them out on our website on the events page. So I'm going to give you some chance to ask me some questions. Um, so thank you so much. Yes. The Pequot. We were enemies with the Pequot and the Mohegan. You have to understand that the Pequot and the Mohegan originally were one people, and then they split off into two people, and they were our historic enemies. Yes. So maintenance of the, what the question is, what would look maintenance of the land look like? So one of the things that we did is we actually had controlled burns historically, um, and that was to ensure that um, the, the forest was managed so things would, could grow really well and not get overgrown. And so that was part of managing. Plus, we farmed, you know, agriculture. Um, you know, our stories, the crow brought us the corn and the bean. But, you know, archaeologists and uh, historians and the like have finally caught up with us that, yes, indeed, we grew corn. Um, and, yes, it did come from the Southwest. So our oral history stories match the, the, the documented science, if you will. So yeah, so we did that kind of thing. And of course, you're out there, we made paths. I mean, there's a path that goes across, mm, I don't know, somewhere over in this area in North Kingstown, maybe Warwick Line, and then goes all the way to New York. It's called the Pequot Path today. But um, you know, it was a path that we were using. Maybe it's because we went over to the Pequots along the way. But nonetheless, um, so that's, that's, you know, managing those things. A lot of the roadways that are the historic roadways, like Post Road, those were footpaths of our people first. Yes. Ah, what's the current status of the museum? Well, we're still knee-deep in the final phases of pre-construction. So <laughs> until we get through the last bit of that rigmarole, <laughs> we have a ways to go. But... Fingers crossed, everybody. Put lots of positive prayers to the Creator. Hopefully, we'll break ground sometime this year. But we are very far along in the pre-construction part. And if you didn't catch the news, we got a new federal grant. It's a challenge grant. So they gave us uh, approximately 444000 And then we have to match it with double. So we have to do about 888000 So feel free to join us <laughs> on that. Yes. So uh, the question is, um, what is the significance of wampum to indigenous people and European colonists? So the, the, the significance to us was that it was sacred and that you used it to honor um, leaders. Um, we did use it in trade. We used it to formalize uh, treaties with other nations. Um, and when Europeans came here and they saw our leaders, like, Canonicus and Marigret and Myantinomi and people of that sort wearing headbands of wampum or quahog shell in both purple and white, um, or a neck piece, or a belt, or an armband, or a leg garter. Um, they equated it with um, kings and queens wearing crowns. And they looked at it as though, well, if a king and queen can quantify the crown in gold and gemstones, then we can quantify the, the shell that is being used on these headbands, um, which they called wampum. Uh, we called wampum, wampum pog, which means white shells, white beads, <laughs> exactly. And they misunderstood and called the whole thing wampum. Um, however, they quantified it. The white was the least value. The purple, light purple was the next, and the darkest purple was the most. However, shortly after it became the whole fad for money, um, the Dutch busted it by uh, creating a way to mass produce, quote unquote, wampum. 
And so um, it was only considered money during the colonial era and not uh, for indigenous people prior to that. That was a great question. Yes. Um, I think I'm not going to answer that. <laughs> Um, because I don't really like people to know where they put them, because then there are some curious minds that are too curious. Um, they did, they reinterred them in the vicinity. I'll put that as the answer. How's that? Yes. Ah, the meaning of Tamaquag. It's from a long word, Tamaquag, if we were to say it more correctly, which means beavers in the Narragansett language. And uh, uh, we were originally founded in Tomaquag Valley, and so we got the name Tomaquag Indian Memorial Museum because we were founded in 1958, and that's an old-fashioned name. So um, we do business as Tomaquag Museum about, and because we're in a big project, we can't change our formal name because we've got too many contracts <laughs> with the legal name that we currently have, so we're keeping it. Obviously, the word Indian has become passe as a word choice. I much prefer indigenous realized word. Um, although if I s tick a box on the census, I have to. Um, and, you know, memorial sounds like memorial. you're dead. And we don't like to encourage that thinking, so <laughs> we stopped using it uh, probably 15 years or more ago. Maybe even more than that, but officially about 15 years ago. So. Yeah, someone else, yeah. So, yeah, so they did produce it similar to our ant. It can last a long time if you live in it. The heat of um, the fires that would keep in it would melt off the snow and keep things from being too brittle and all of that. When you don't live in it, you've got to rebuild it, which is kind of why in our new museum, um, we built a few uh, mushkitos or longhouses um, and we choose the smaller dwelling at the museum on and off. But they kind of last for a season and then they fall apart because there's nobody there to keep it warm and keep the snow from making it fall all apart. Um, in our new museum, we actually have a plan to make a Meshkito or longhouse in partnership with the steel yard. So it'll actually be made out of steel and look patinaed like wood, but it'll allow kids to go in and kids at heart to go in and check it out and do things, but we're going to make it like an art installation inside. So where yeah, the, the, the saplings go this way and this way, it creates rectangles. So when you sit down on the bench, there'll be rectangles over your head that they can tell a story. And then we're going to do with um, Smoke Signals, which is a design firm out of um, an exhibit design firm out of uh, Mashpee, uh, Mashpee Wampanoag territory. Um, they are Mashpee Wampanoag, and we're going to do um, a Nashpee territory. I hope I said that wrong. Uh, um, brain is not working. Um, a machine, there we go, a machine, which is a canoe, um, and it's going to be a whole installation where people will be able to get in it and take a selfie and all of that, <laughs> which is fun. And then we're going to do a retu that will be an annual where um, the community will get together and make the retu and, you know, visitors can participate in that kind of thing. Because if, you, if when it's out of full natural materials, you have to keep doing it over and over again. So it'll be part of you know, something that we can do every year. Yes. So the question is, how do current Narragansett children learn their heritage in their language? So first from their families. Um, then from our tribal community, we have our DLN has programs and natural resources, the education department has programs, the health department has programs, the police department has programs, you know, every department has programs that people can do things and we have ceremonies that are scheduled throughout the year that are for our community. Um, so you're learning, you know, by being part of a community. Um, and then 
organizations like Tomaquag Museum also help with that because we we actually have we get to do the, all the fun stuff, right? So we get to have special guest speakers um, come in um, for you, the public but also for the Native community as a whole. So we have a program called the Indigenous Empowerment Center. Um, and in that program, uh, we can have a culture bearer come in, uh, like uh, you know any elder or any community member. I'm thinking of one that was teaching twining, which is a very traditional art form. And that artist would come in, do the twining for the Native community, teach next generations how to twine, because it's not easy to do, um, and um, get them competent, culturally competent, if you will, in that particular art form. And then you, as the public, you get to have a artist talk, or an artist demonstration, or um, something of that sort. Sometimes classes, depending on the art form, there are some art forms that are just for the Native community, and others that sometimes are open to the general public. And so um, that's how those things are continued. And language, again, from their families, from our tribal community, um, from Tomaquag Museum, Lindsay does language with Lindsay. Anybody can see it, they're little short videos on how to say things. So, you know, you want to learn how to say I love you, Kalamanash. If you want to say hello, Askoliklasen. You know, um, you know, each time she'll do a different set of words or phrase or whatever, and that'll continue. Um, and then we all use it in our community. Like our, we have staff that's you know, quite a lot of Native people, but also some are not Narragansett. <laughs> Many are Narragansett, but some are not Narragansett, and some are not Native at all. But even the non-Native staff, th one of our newest staff members, um, Erica, she's um, our newest archivist, and she came in and she's like, a school to Squamson, <laughs> which is good morning. And <laughs> she's gotten to the point, she's only been here like two months, and she already is, because we're always saying it to everybody else, right? So then you just start to get used to it, and, and they just start saying it. So it's through that, it's through use, it's through the community, it's really important to continue those things. Um, we've had formal language programs at the tribe. Um, my mom used to be a teacher. Um, Ella Sikatao, um, the late Ella Sikatao, um, and there were people before them. Um, there's even documentation, even though detribalization happened in the 1880s, um, it was like in the 1890s that there's documentation of language classes. So there's that continuation and importance of language going forward. Anyone else? A question? Sure. Way in the back. Do I know the names of any sachems before Canonicus and Myantanum? Hmm. I'm sure I'm supposed to, but <laughs> right now I'm blank. Um, so keep in mind, I will say this. Even though I'm a historian, I'm an oral historian versus a scholarly historian. So we might have to get someone like Max Scott, who's a Narragansett historian. Maybe he knows the answer to that question. You know, those ones that are common, that are always in your mind. Beyond that, I can't really recall. At the museum, but they tend to be sort of contact going forward. And part of the reason of that is that's when things got documented. Right? And so then it's easy to remember the ones that were documented the most. Um, and those that were before them, it would be like comments in documentation where they would say that this one was, this, the sachem you know, Canonicus, for example, and then they would be talking about like his father or grandfather or something like that, but they may or may not say their name. They just say, you know, reference. So, so I don't really know. I can't answer that one well. Yes. Yes. So her question is, are there people in the Caribbean now that are aware that they descend from, you know, indigenous people here that ended up over there as slaves? And yes, there was a big program, that well project um, in Bermuda. Um, it's more than 20, well, I shouldn't even call it a project because it's lives. Um, people 20 years or more ago, uh, time is flying, um, connected. Taluk, who I mentioned when, with the drawing, he was one of the first people to do that. They made a reconnection with those people in Bermuda um, on St. David's Island, which happens to be the last island in the archipelago. When um, people were 
taken from here and enslaved there, um, the ecosystem is similar enough, even though different, similar enough that people would escape enslavement and then escape to the last island on the archipelago, which, by the way, wasn't connected with a bridge until the 1950s. They were very isolated. And um, they descend from people from here, but they're, they are a bit of a mixture between Caribbean indigenous peoples, mainland indigenous peoples, and um, African descended peoples is mixed together. They actually have a dance that they call the gumbo that represents those three cultures entwined. Um, and the uh, folks there, it's really uncanny um, how similar we look. There's one um, gentleman over there, I uh, guess it doesn't matter what his name is, but um, it's Kevin. <laughs> He looks so much like my brother-in-law that he almost looks more like my brother-in-law than my husband. Like, that's how uncanny they look similarly. And so 20-plus years, we've been having a really strong relationship with them. And they come here and participate in our ceremonies here in the, in the region of the Atlantic to, you know, Mashpee, you know, and Sh Pequot and Mohegan and Shinnecock and all of these tribes in this region. Um, and we go over there, they have a, an indigenous uh, celebration every two years, and people go over there. Um, I brought a whole group of uh, students, native students over there, um, back in, I don't know, 2007 or eight, somewhere in there. And, um, and they sent some of their students over here, and we did a cultural exchange uh, with those kids. And so it was really, it's really beautiful. And, and truth be told, the relationships are really deep. My niece, um, when she got married, one of the girls, the women that was from there, that they grew up as little kids over those 20 some odd years, and um, they were in each other's weddings. So it's a really strong relationship between those, that community and ours. And there's a book out there by Brinky Sinclair um, that's about the, the Indians of Bermuda. I can't remember the title of the book, but the author is Brinky Sinclair. You might be able to find it. Anyone else? I think there was someone over here that kept, yes, that kept asking. Hmm. Sure. So the, the question is around how can we um, make the history more visible of indigenous people and to speak to the repair and reconciliation that needs to happen and how can, you know, as a town, can that be done? So, you know, I think there's a lot of things that can be done. One thing that you're doing is what we just did tonight is, is opening up um, your minds and hearts to maybe a different perspective on the same history. Um, it's it's um, inviting the business tables, the community tables, um, to be part of those conversations. Um, there's you can create things, and I think this is minimal. Uh, is creating land acknowledgments at meetings to acknowledge the land that you're on. Um, we do have a guide to land acknowledgments in our blog, and Silverman the Rose, our assistant director, guides community organizations through the process of creating the land acknowledgement. Um, that's a minimal first step. Um, it's you know improving curriculum in K-12 schools, um, which across our state is abysmal on indigenous history and culture. I will say it a million times. There is no such thing as Rhode Island history without Narragansett, Niantic, and other indigenous people's history. There is no such thing as US history without indigenous people's history. We were here before, during, and currently. And so 
there's nothing that you're teaching that we're not incorporated in. The problem lies in our structure of education. The teachers, and I was one for 20 years, they weren't taught in their formative K-12 years, college years, anything about it. So when they're asked to teach it again, they go back to the same thing, whatever way they learned, which usually was, you're in Rhode Island, let's talk about the Navajo. I don't know. They're always talking about somebody that's not anywhere near here. Um, and not any offense to my Dene relatives that I know, but the point is they don't tend to want to talk about what's right here because it's too close to home. But you can't heal and have reconciliation if you don't. Um, if you don't acknowledge that the Narragansett Nation is the only federally recognized nation in the state of Rhode Island, then you can't have reconciliation. If you can't invite people to the table to have some conversations around these things, then you can't have reconciliation and healing. Um, I do believe in reconciliation and healing. Um, in the book, uh, Repair uh, Sustainable Design Futures, my chapter is all on reconciliation and healing in regards to uh, conquest, colonization, and, and what needs to be done to repair that. Um, so I think it's really important, but I also am an educator, and I believe that if you tell the truth in education, then we're all better off for it. Um, most times when college students, either college students that I've taught, because I've taught a couple of classes, or college students that come to the museum with their professors, they're really aggravated, uh, some really and uh, outraged that their K-12 experience, they knew nothing. And, and they're shocked by what they're learning. Um, and as the saying goes, we can't, you know, he learn from history if we don't actually teach it, right? If we can't learn from it and stop making the same mistakes. Um, and so I think that those are really big things. I mean, education is probably the key to it all. Um, and we wouldn't have to have land acknowledgments if people knew what land they were on. Um, some have no idea. Like, people come here, this is a country of immigrants, and they come in and they don't know that, you know, Petasquamskit and Nisquamakit and Wikipog and Uskapog and whatever else are indigenous words. They just don't know, and they have no idea. So until we start educating people, they won't have any knowledge to know that that is impactful and that um, indigenous people have contributed to this state and country. Um, we talked about serving in the military, but there's we've served in all kinds of capacities despite the fact that we're living in an oppressed society. We're still the most impoverished people in the state of Rhode Island. Significantly most impoverished. We're also the most unhoused. The only reason why we're not completely unhoused is because we're used to being in families, intergenerational families, so we just put more generations in a household, right? But um, statistically speaking, we're the most unhoused in the state of Rhode Island. And, and part of that is to do with the political ramifications of lots of things that have taken place over the last 400 years and what's taken place over the last 100 years, um, from detribalization to federal recognition to, to now, um, is really complex. And we can't go there now, we'll be here till 11. <laughs> but you get the idea, the more we know about those things, the more we can unpack them. I suppose we can do one more question, so we won't end abruptly. So if you're speaking to August meeting, yes. So the Narragansett August meeting power, which you are all invited to come, um, it is open to the public. It is always the weekend that hosts second Sunday in August, which I think this year might be the 10th and the 11th. Not sure. You have to find the second Sunday. It's always the Saturday and Sunday, but it's the second Sunday in August. In Charlestown, you can't miss it. Drive down Route 2. Old Mill Road, Indian Church Road. Um, actually, you can't even get that far down. Uh, just Old Mill Road, and, and you can park at the administration building there. Um, so it's the oldest recorded Native gathering in the whole entire United States. How many of you have been? Oh, not too bad, not too shabby. I've been in plenty of rooms where two people have raised their hands, so that was pretty good. Um, the rest of you all have a homework assignment. August. Mark it down, second Sunday, it's Saturday and Sunday. Um, it's the oldest recorded native gathering. It stems from our green corn Thanksgiving or the early harvest of the corn, um, one of our 13 Thanksgivings. 
Um, and it's a great gathering. Um, it's on historic land down by the Indian Church. You can, on Saturday, if you get there early, around 11, I think, is the Tiny Top pageant over on the, the, the <laughs> drum over by the side of the church. And on Sunday, you can go to church services. Um, some people like to do that as the first entry because people are always curious. And then we have uh, non-native folks that go all year long <laughs> and have for many a year. So sometimes that's an intro um, to be able to go to the church and just get to meet some folks. Um, and that's part of that reconciliation and healing. We got to meet people. Like people are afraid of people when they don't know people. And then when you go, oh, they're just people. Look at that. Um, you'll find that they're very nice. <laughs> And, and if you find that they're not nice, that's just like everywhere else in the world. Sometimes there's a nice person, and sometimes there's a not nice person. So um, people are people. Um, so yeah, that's a great thing to do. It's really, you can come say hi to me. We're there. Stand for Tom McCoy Museum at Palo, and um, you can see Dean Lynn, championship dancer, uh, uh, Fancy Shawl, and um, many other uh, of my family and friends there. So it's a great thing to do. And there are other powwows, but you certainly should go to the Narragansett August meeting because it's the oldest one in the country recorded. So that's uh, before I used to off what year it is. Do you know what year? I, ever since COVID, I can't remember what year it is. Um, so uh, three, 347, I think. I don't know. I've gotten lost in it. Um, so. So uh, that was excellent. Thank you for uh, kicking us off uh, for our lecture series. And I want to give you, uh, this is one of our uh, challenge coins for our 350th. And I would ask uh, everyone, if you are able, uh, to consider making a donation to uh, help with the construction of the museum. Um, and uh, we look forward uh, to including um, the Narragansett uh, tribe in our family day events, our parades, uh, the other 350th uh, day event or anniversary events. Thank you. And, uh, thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Uh, it looks like we filled out the venue this evening. Um, we'll take that into consideration in planning the next one. Um, and uh, if you did not see, we do have commemorative uh, merchandise that is available both on the website uh, for the town and also at events like this. So uh, your purchases will help fund our upcoming events such as the uh, gala which is planned for Thursday the 25th of April. Um, we have a family day event, which is in September. I think it's the 15th. And then we will have a 350th uh, anniversary parade, which is October the 5th. And, and uh, there is a published schedule for uh, the follow-on lectures that we will be having. And any inputs uh, to other activities or events uh, are most welcome. I will tell you for the uh, gala, uh, that we have booked uh, Take It to the Bridge uh, as our band. And for the parade, um, we, are, uh, we have uh, booked um, the um, Providence uh, Police Department Clydesdales. And we have also uh, booked the uh, Professional Firefighters Bagpiper Unit. So, um, so. We look forward to your participation in uh, those events as well. Thank you. Add one last thing. Don't forget to come visit us at Tom McCoy Museum in Exeter. I have Saturdays 10 to 2 for drop-by visitors, but the info is on the website. So if you check us out there. Thank you, everyone. Katabatash, Pishkanash. <laughs>